Let's see how to practically analyze the lateral part of this knee. To begin with, we study the iliotibial band. To locate it, we start from the patellar tendon slash ligament. We see its low insertion. Slowly we translate the probe sideways, and the first structure we find is the iliotibial band. We can see it perfectly here, its insertion on the tibia. We see a little distension and a normal little bursa. We verify that there is no significant swelling at this level. Then, we go up slowly to visualize the band next to the femoral condyle. We know that in this place, bursitis, the famous iliotibial band syndrome, can develop. Here we see that there is absolutely no hypoechoic rearrangement between the band and the femoral condyle. If there is one, it is necessary to perform a dynamic maneuver, the translation of the patella. Why? Because when we analyze the iliotibial band and the femoral condyle, we know that the retro quadriceps recess is very close, and therefore the hypoechoic swelling, or even the fluid distension, that we see under the band can correspond to the lateral part of this cul-de-sac. For this reason, we push the patella slightly lateral to open the cul-de-sac, and thus, we see here that the lateral portion of the cul-de-sac does not extend too much later. It remains here in the anterior part, and it does not come to insinuate itself between the band and the femoral condyle. We look at this band until its tibial insertion. Here it is. There is no enthesopathy. We have the normal recess on the deep side of this insert. Once we have visualized this first anterolateral structure, we will ask the patient to slightly bend the knee and above all, to turn his foot in internal rotation. We will resume the analysis of this iliotibial band. There it is. And then, we will slightly position the probe more posterior to discover an important element that has been rediscovered recently, the anterolateral ligament. It is difficult to see it in the normal state. It passes here to the peripheral side of the external or lateral meniscus, and which forms a common insertion with the lateral collateral ligament which we will see later. Once we have seen this anterolateral ligament, let's take a good look in this position at the lateral meniscus in search of a small fissure, but especially for a cystic process, which most often develops in the anterolateral, exactly at this place on the periphery of the meniscus. This area is also very accessible to an ultrasound-guided puncture. So on this section, we have the femur, lateral meniscus, the tibia, and the anterolateral ligament. We will now position our probe on the lateral part of the femur. There is an important bone mark. It is this notch in which the popliteal tendon is inserted. We will analyze it later. But we are now going to analyze the lateral collateral ligament. Here we find the iliotibial band, which will go up to the iliac crest, and we can see that the lateral collateral ligament is inserted just above the popliteal tendon attachment. As it is inserted distally on the head of the fibula, we make a small rotation of the probe to orient it toward the head of the fibula, and we visualize perfectly the lateral collateral ligament on the surface of the external or lateral meniscus. It lines the proximal part of the popliteal tendon and is inserted in the upper part of this notch. This lateral collateral ligament is stretched in extension. It often relaxes slightly in flexion, but we see in this patient that there is no problem. We can see that its distal part is quite complex. It is inserted on the head of the fibula. The tibia is here. The tibiofibular line is here. It will penetrate into the distal portion of the biceps tendon. 
we see that the fibers of the lateral collateral ligament lie between the superficial part of the biceps tendon and its deep part. If we turn our probe now in the other direction, we see the lateral collateral ligament, which is located in the center of the distal enthesis of this biceps tendon on the head of the fibula. We will then follow this tendon upwards until its myotendinous insertion and the muscle will always line the deep face of the tendon in the longitudinal plane, but also in the axial plane, where you see the biceps tendon on the surface of the muscle. Let's continue the study of this biceps tendon in this plane. We will slowly descend in the axial plane and we will find the lateral collateral ligament, which is located a little farther anterior here and which will, as we see, literally enter within the anterior fibers of this biceps tendon to have a common insertion with it on the head of the fibula. Another very important point at this level. We must never forget that there is, in fact, a double insertion of this biceps tendon, the first being the main one on the head of the fibula, but we also have fibers which go to the tibial plateau. In this patient, there are very few. Here, there are only a few fibers that attach to the tibial plateau. But in other patients, it will be a predominant insertion with two arms dividing the bicipital tendon in the sagittal plane at its distal insertion. Here we see that there are few fibers that come to insert on the tibial plateau, starting from this biceps tendon and this slit, which we see inside the tendon and is in fact the only passage of the lateral collateral ligament. So we saw the iliotibial band. We saw its passage on the lateral aspect of the condyle. We made the dynamic maneuver to see if the cul-de-sac crept between the band and the condyle. We looked at the anterior lateral ligament. We looked at the femoral hollow with the departure of the popliteus tendon. We have seen that at this place was also inserted the lateral collateral ligament, which we followed until its passage in the biceps tendon, which we then studied until its myotendinous junction in the sagittal plane. Then in the axial plane, we looked for a possible accessory insertion of this biceps tendon on the tibial plateau. It remains for us, therefore, to study the popliteus tendon. For that, we're going to ask the patient to turn around a little bit. Here we'll start again from the small hollow, which is located at the lateral part of the condyle. We will turn our probe slightly, and we will study the passage of this popliteus tendon, lowering our focal length a little, and with a little more gain, to study perfectly here the passage of the popliteus tendon on the surface of this lateral meniscus. On the other hand, the small insertions of the meniscus on the tendon are not visible on ultrasound, but we can see the tendon perfectly at this level, and above all, we can see that there is no fluid collection interposed between the tendon and the meniscus. We will see during the posterior study the myotendinous junction of this popliteus tendon. The iliotibial band, popliteus tendon, anterolateral ligament, lateral collateral ligament, lateral meniscus, and the biceps tendon. We see that this side of the knee face is rich in lessons, and we really have to study it systematically to be sure not to omit anything.